And the Japanese yeah. proverb says, fall down seven times, get back up eight. And what do we really call this? We really call it resiliency. And we also have to have more reasons to succeed than to fail. And once we program our mind like that, you become unstoppable. So knowing these two things, if you hired just on what motivated people, you'd build a winning team immediately. Daniel, welcome to the show. Great to have you here. It's a uh, true pleasure, and I'm excited to uh, share some new and practical ideas to start to shift those mindsets. Excellent. So perhaps you could start off with a little bit about your story. Who are you? Where are you? What do you do? In around about 1994, I was invited down to the Nepean River, uh, which is just in Penrith. So the people who follow football, um, there's, a, there's the Penrith Panthers team. And I was invited down there to go wakeboarding behind the back of a boat. And I arrived at the dock and my brother was there and another guy named Tony. And I hopped in the boat and they went out wakeboarding. And I was looking at them going, wow, how do you do that? And they went up and down the river and they said, Daniel, it's your turn. And I'd been watching them and all of a sudden, as soon as they said, it's your turn, all of this doubt kicked in. You know, I'd been a big hero inside of my mind, what I was going to do on the board. And they, then they said, it's your turn. And I started to come up with excuses. You know, the, the water's cold. I don't have a wetsuit. I don't have my own gear. Uh, I've got to do something after this. And I started to develop excusitis as soon as I needed to get out of my comfort zone. And Tony and my brother kept pushing me saying, come on, it's easy, get in the water. And I hopped in the water and I could feel the reeds on the inside of my leg and I didn't like that. And then it triggered thoughts of what's below the water, a fish, an eel's going to bite me. And what I realized was I was sabotaging my own success. And I developed all of these good excuses. And they said, you know, stop being a weakling, stop being a pussy, just give it a go. And so I kind of gave into the peer pressure and I thought, on my first attempt, I'm going to pretend that I hurt myself. And so they pulled me out of the water and I grabbed my back. Oh, my back. And I found every excuse to uh, hop back into the water. And they said, uh, we know you're faking it. <laughs> <laughs> keep going. And so I learned at a young age just how easy it is to sabotage your own success, especially doing something really fun. And that was a challenge that I had to face for many, many years. And today, um, I would say I'm very happy that uh, I'm close to mastery on that topic. Very interesting. It's uh, I've experienced a, a similar situation. It was once upon a time I was going surfing in front of a girlfriend at the time's parents. Before I had even paddled out, I had already started making the excuses as to why I performed poorly. The self-sabotage, what, what, what is it all about? Where does it come from? For me, it came from having learning disabilities. And at around about age 11, I was diagnosed with linear sequential learning disability and I did have legitimate challenges. My left and right brain wouldn't communicate correctly. And that was because the cranial plates in, in the skull hadn't formed properly. And they were pushing down on the left and right hemisphere of the brain. And there was so much wow. pressure build up inside of the brain that I had a visual impairment. It was legitimate. I couldn't see correctly. I'd also developed tone deafness and I couldn't hear the differences in sounds. I would sit there at school, I'd come home and my nose would just start to bleed because of all the pressure built up inside of the skull. And I had a legitimate diagnosis. And I, and I went through about five years of remedial therapy. And so for me, where it started was, it started with having a legitimate diagnosis. But then because I'd been accustomed to so much pain, I wanted to avoid pain. I was so focused mm. on getting things right and not making a mistake. This episode is brought to you by Start With Values. If you'd like to reduce stress and increase fulfillment in your work and life, then check out startwithvalues.com. There, you'll be able to download the Values app, which helps you to discover your core values and bring them to life through micro habits. 
There is a values course so that you can learn about the science and practice of core values, and you'll be able to pre-register for my forthcoming book called Start With Values. I hope that these tools will enable you to achieve more fulfillment and make more meaningful decisions on your journey of life. Now back to the episode. Because for me, mistakes were painful. You know, when I made a spelling mistake because I couldn't see, I was made to stand up in the room and I was shamed. Then I would write things down in my book and I'd be asked to read it out and it'd be wrong and I'd be shamed. So I realized that making mistakes was painful. But then what happened was once I'd overcome the learning disability, I had never overcome that behavior of sabotage or that fear of making a mistake and feeling I was going to get exposed or punished for it. And a lot of people have that same challenge in their childhood experience. They're shamed for making a mistake, but you can't practice perfection. It's like a surfer. You're going to have to wipe out on a hundred different waves before you even realize how you paddle on and stand up. (laughs) You're going to do a bottom turn and you're going to go the wrong direction. But in surfing, what we tend to do is we say, okay, I learned from that. I'll swim back out, but there's nobody there to punish us. So that's how it started for me. That was the root cause for me. Makes a lot of sense. Tell me about your career as an athlete. The highlight of my career was in 2006 when I became the Australian men's wakeboarding champion. And that was a goal that I set uh, 10 years earlier and I was going to achieve it in one year. And on that journey to become an Australian champion athlete, there was many highs. Uh, I remember I competed at the Extreme Games which is the equivalent of uh, the Olympics for extreme sports. And I was there competing in the top 10 in the world. I'd gone on to one, uh, three state championships, many other competitions. And the journey for me took nine years longer than most people. Because when I started, there was people becoming Australian champions in their first year. But for me, every time it came to a competition, there was always something missing in my performance, whether it been a broken nose. I remember in 1996, I went out and I was uh, being coached by some world champions. And during coaching, I broke my nose. So that set me back from competitions. I had beaten, been beaten up by a bunch of five guys and they almost killed me. And I ended up in hospital and major surgeries on my arm and plates put in. So I missed another year of competition. I then had two major knee reconstructions. And so I had to learn to walk again. I had to learn to ride again. I had to develop that resilience through that. And so I had a lot of obstacles, but I was very resilient and I was very focused on the goal. And once I set that goal, I had to do whatever it took. So for me, although it took me 10 years to achieve a goal that other people had achieved in one year, I had built a resilient personality. And today we call that the hardy personality. It's the personality that can weather all storms. And for me, that was the biggest win. It was the personality that I took away that I've still been able to leverage uh, you know, 15, 20 years later. You're known as Asia's number one business coach. Can you tell us what led you to build an interest uh, to become an actual coach? I got a phone call when I was about 16, and it was from some businessmen in Sydney, and they said, would you come and coach wakeboarding? (laughs) You know, the one that I just tried to sabotage my own success on. Would you come and coach wakeboarding to our community? And I was like, you want me to do it? I said, I'll just come and ride for free. And they said, no, we'll pay you. We'll pay you hundreds of dollars. And I said, well, uh, I love it so much that I'd do it for free, but the money uh, sounds good. So I started coaching water sports, and it was quite interesting that I could just share one or two tips with somebody, and they could learn a new trick in a matter of minutes. And that skill set of coaching, it took me all across the country, and it even took me over to Dubai. And I was the first Australian athlete in Dubai to bring wakeboarding to the country. And when I got there, I'd partnered with a English businessman. And he had been given a private waterway from one of the sheikhs in Abu Dhabi. And they had spent more than a billion 
dollars making this waterway, six kilometers long, and we were given it for free. And they paid and they gave us boats. And I went over there and I coached uh, businessmen, <laughs> millionaires, uh, even the Sheikh's children on how to wakeboard. And then I was put on the television, I was put in the media and on the radio, and I was just doing what I loved. And and I knew at that stage I was uh, 27 and, you know, the outdoor conditions in Dubai in summertime, it can be, you know, in excess of 60 degrees in the direct sun, you know, that direct sunlight coming down on your head. And I thought to myself, I don't know how long I can do this for. So I changed careers and I ended up working with Emirates Airline and I took a leadership position. And as a senior flight steward, I was co-leading a team of 17,500 cabin crew. And during that period at Emirates Airline, every day we would go into a briefing room. And what shook me was so many people just didn't know what their strengths or their skills were. And I remember our leaders would say, Ladies and gentlemen, please introduce yourself and tell us your number one skill. And people would say, hi, my name's uh, Samantha. And everybody would wait for the special skill. And they say, I don't know what my special skill is. And so I thought, mm. I've, got a, I've got a special skill. And so I would say to my team, I'd say, my name's Daniel and I'm a life coach. And every eyeball in the room from the juniors to the seniors to the captains, all eyes were on me. And they went, you're a life coach. And then on the aircraft, people would line up to have a conversation with me. That's how I'm having this relationship challenge. I'm having this family challenge. I'm having this finance challenge. Could I talk to you about it? And so I started to do coaching sessions or what we would call jump seat therapy. And I'd be doing this at 40,000 feet. I'd be doing it in the back of the aircraft. I had even done interventions inside the airport. One customer was walking across the air bridge and they were about to step on to the aircraft and the air bridge automatically leveled and it dropped about six inches. And immediately it sent the lady into a panic attack and they couldn't get her off the air bridge. They couldn't get her onto the aircraft. And because I had announced myself as the life coach, the captain made a PA and he said, uh, Daniel Tolson, would you please come to the cockpit? So I came to the cockpit. He briefed me on what happened and he said, could you fix this lady? And I said, well, uh, send me out on the air bridge and I'll see what I can do. I went out. I did a very quick NLP intervention. I brought her onto the aircraft. I walked her from first class to business class to economy class. I had her laughing on takeoff. And we flew her all the way to China. And she wrote to me a, a couple of years later. She said, Daniel, I've been looking for you everywhere. She said, I had just been divorced. I had been separated from my partner. I hadn't seen my daughter for two years. And when that air bridge automatically adjusted, all of my fears from the past came up in that one moment. And she said, I didn't know what direction to take my life. And she said, that one intervention with you changed my life. She said, as soon as we landed in China, my flights were delayed and I had to take this little aircraft. And we went to some deep, remote part of China. And she said, after that, I had to take a smaller aircraft. And she said, the confidence that I had. And then a couple of months later, she sent me a selfie photo of her paragliding around um, South America. And she said, that one thing changed my life. And so for me, I thought to myself, this is a way that I can be a doctor. You know, maybe I'll never go to medical school, but I can help people with their mindset. And so by the time I finished at Emirates Airline, I had had thousands of coaching conversations and then I launched my business and I've been doing that ever since uh, 2012. What a story. What a journey. And it's just real evidence that a coach at the right time can really help you overcome your fear or your limiting self-beliefs and a lot of people say oh, i don't know if i can afford to invest in a coach but if you have a an ambition or you want to improve yourself or grow i think having that second a different perspective can be hugely valuable i'd love to hear your thoughts on 
How can we reduce our stress? And I'm sure you get asked this a lot as a coach, but stress seems to be ubiquitous. I don't remember people being as stressed as they are right now, 10, 15 years ago, and it could be because of information overload. What are your thoughts on helping people to reduce stress and make better decisions? It all starts with sleep. And uh, Vince Lombardi, he was the coach of the Green Bay Packers football team. And he said, fatigue makes cowards of us all. And we all know that after we've had a really good, deep sleep, you wake up energized, you wake up optimistic, you're ready to take on the world. And we all know that after a good night's sleep, everything's possible. That optimism is there. But unfortunately, the way the world is at the moment is we've got 50% of the world's population who are suffering sleep deprivation. They're getting less than five hours of sleep per night. And if you look at people's sleep hygiene, people are still awake at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning. And these periods of time are essential for the body to heal, restore, and to release hormones. So between the hours of uh, 11 p.m. and 1 p.m., this is the time that your gallbladder actually needs to function. But people are awake. They're watching TV, they're snacking, they're drinking alcohol, and the gallbladder can't function. The sign that you've got an underactive gallbladder is when you wake up in the morning and you've got aches and pains in your body. And it used to happen to me. I would stay up till one o'clock in the morning and my mum would say, you know, how's life in Taiwan? I'd say, you know, this, this climate's tough on the body. This climate's tough on the body. You wake up, you're feeling sore. Well, I didn't realize I wasn't allowing my gallbladder to work. And once I improved my sleep hygiene and I was in bed before 10 p.m., every morning I wake up, there's no pain. There's no discomfort. So the first thing is we've got to start with sleep. Also, between the hours of uh, 1 a.m. and 3 a.m., this is when the liver starts to detoxify the body. Now, if you're having as little as one glass of alcohol per night, that's enough to disturb three to four hours of sleep. And if you've ever had it before, and I know it's happened to me, I would drink a glass of alcohol and I'd wake up at one or three o'clock of the morning, somewhere between there, and I'd feel like the hangover had worn off. I felt like the alcohol had worn off. But what's happening from a Chinese medical perspective is that the liver is agitated. It's got this toxin in the body and it can't flush it out. So because of the agitation on the body, it wakes you up and it interrupts your sleep. Now, the liver also relates to the emotion of anger and it stores anger. And if it can't detoxify the body and can't release the anger, then that emotion gets stored in the liver. Now, the liver also controls your level of energy. So if you're awake between 11 and 1, the gallbladder's not working. If you're awake between 1 and 3 a.m. or you've drunk alcohol, and people who drink alcohol, 70% of those people are sleep deprived. And so if you're not asleep during those key periods, the body doesn't restore, regenerate, and release healthy and happy hormones. So if we want to become better, we've got to start with sleep. It's always the place all of us should start. And if you went and had seven days of really good restorative sleep, half of your mental and emotional problems will disappear. And just remember what we said, fatigue makes cowards of us all. And it is the number one cause of negative emotions. But unfortunately, nobody says it. But Brad, you and I will say it. I'm with you on that. And it's it's transformative. I remember when I decided to fix sleep. And it was after my daughter was born. And there's a level of trauma each night. I'm going to bed. Is she going to wake up? And eventually you start to get this consistent period where she sleeps through the night. And you're like, okay, why am I still up at 1 a.m. then? Maybe I can start to make some changes. And you do, and you really notice the difference. For me, tracking it made a big difference. I used wearables and really started to monitor, you know, what am I doing in that last hour? What do I do Mm -hmm. when I wake up? How much deep versus REM? 
And even just that level of awareness, is, it, it's, it changed my life. I have to be honest. So I'm 100% aligned with you. Any tips for people who want to embark on the journey of improved sleep? Do you recommend wearables, uh, bedtime routine, anything in particular? I think to start with having a wearable, um, something like a Whoop or a Fitbit, is really good to give you that level of self-awareness. And in emotional intelligence, we say awareness precedes change. And I was working with a gentleman recently and he prided himself on getting seven hours of sleep a night. And I said, let's have a look at what the whoop says. And the whoop said that he was lucky to get 20 to 30% restorative sleep. And he said, oh my gosh, I've always prided myself of getting seven hours of sleep. But when I look at the data, it's only 20 to 30% restorative. I had another client and she had aches and pains in the body. She had sleep apnea. She had sleep disorders. And I said, do you wear a Fitbit or a Whoop? And she said, yeah. I said, let's have a look at the numbers. She said, Daniel, my sleep's fine. And so we had a look at it. She was getting less than 20 minutes of restorative sleep. Oh, stop. Wow. So mm. we have to get the facts. We have to get the real facts. And we've got to stop looking at the imagined or the hope for facts. We've got to get the facts. And, and that's what we say in emotional intelligence. We have to have a level of self-awareness. And awareness always precedes change. So once you get the awareness, then you can start to change. Excellent. Tell us about developing emotional intelligence and how can it help us become the best version of ourselves? A topic that... I've been asked about many times is procrastination. Can emotional intelligence help with that? Absolutely. I grew up in the western suburbs of Sydney and in the 90s and the 2000s, we would have heard the buzzword emotional intelligence, uh, but we would have had no idea of what it actually meant. And in the pawnbroking business, we always said you had to be street smart. And so once I got into the depths of emotional intelligence, I realized that it was just being street smart. And that was the key to it. Mm. And over the past decade, I've spoken on this topic and I've found that there's five pillars of emotional intelligence. The first three have to do with you and absolutely to do with procrastination. And the other two pillars have to do with others. So we start with self-awareness. Self-awareness is understanding why you think and feel the way that you do. And we say if you can't name it, you can't tame it. So if you don't know that you're experiencing fear of failure or fear of rejection, you can't do anything about it. So you've got to be able to name it. The second pillar is self-regulation. And this is the ability to get yourself out of any mental or emotional rut that you're in. And we hear it all the time. People say, you know, I'm just depressed. Okay. And what are you doing about it? Nothing. Because just because you know you're depressed, that doesn't automatically give you the skill to get out of that mental or emotional rut. So regulation is about getting out of that and getting out of depression and into a healthy emotional state like happiness or joy. The third pillar of emotional intelligence is motivation. And to make it clear, this is not the Tony Robbins model of jumping up and down. It's not doing that. Motivation is the Mike Tyson model of motivation. It's getting punched in the face and getting back up and rolling with the punches. And the Japanese proverb says, fall down seven times, get back up eight. And what do we really call this? We really call it resiliency. That's where resiliency is in emotional intelligence. So what do we need to stop procrastination? Well, we have to start with self-awareness. Why do I think and feel the way that I do? If I'm not taking action, there has to be an emotion that's preventing me from taking action. Because we have 60,000 thoughts a day. Those thoughts, 80% are on repeat. And it's those thoughts that influence our emotions. So if I'm not excited, if I'm not hopeful, if I'm not optimistic, I'm never going to take action. 
So we've got to be aware of the emotional state and the thoughts that precede that. Once we're aware of what's preventing us from procrastinating, then we can go into new coping or regulation methods. But we also need motivation. If your level of desire is not high enough, if that want and need, if that fire is not on inside of your body, you'll never take action. So the desire also has to be there. So I was working with a gentleman recently and he set a goal. And I said, why do you want to achieve this goal? He said, I don't know, it's probably the right thing to do. And I said, okay, what I want you to do is I want you to write down 20 ideas on paper why you must not fail and give me 20 reasons why you must succeed. He's like, that's really hard. I said, you want a million dollar goal, but you don't even have 40 reasons why you should achieve it. He said, okay, I can come up with 40. He went away, he came back a month later and he gave me a list of 10. I said, that's not good enough. I said, give me 50. He said, but last time you told me 20. I said, no, 50 now, why you must not fail and 50 why you must succeed. He came back another month later and he still hadn't done it. I said, obviously this goal isn't important to you. I said, go away and give me 100 reasons why you must succeed and 100 reasons why you must not fail. He said, Daniel, it started at 20. I said, I know, and you didn't do it. You mustn't want the goal. He said, well, I'll do 50. I said, well, you didn't do it at 50. You must want it enough. I said, give me 100. So he went away and a month later, he'd come back and he said, Daniel, I've got this. Listen, I've quit my job. (laughs) I said, you've quit your job. I said, why did you do that? He said, because it doesn't align with what I want. I said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to start a business. So he went and started a business. He bought a 50% share in a business. He worked and worked and worked. Within two years, he acquired the other 50% share. Today, he employs 14 people. He owns the number one real estate in his office. He's on the television. He's on the radio. He's in the media. People are lining up to work with him. And he said, Daniel, I've never been so motivated. I said, have you ticked off that list of 100? He said, there's so much there that I just can't tick it off yet. He said, I'm still going. And so that's the key. We've got to be aware of what we want and what's holding us back. We've got to learn new strategies to get out of that mental and emotional rut. And we also have to have more reasons to succeed than to fail. And once we program our mind like that, you become unstoppable. Amazing toolkit. I love that idea of sending someone back and with more, if you're serious about it. Don't, uh, otherwise, you're, you're obviously not serious. I hear many stories of people, I want to be an entrepreneur, but when the rubber hits the road, it's it's a lot harder than it seems. So make sure that you really want these these big goals. Do you ever find that, that some people come to you with dreams that just are not suited to them? Yep. And the old way of goal setting was to set these big, hairy, audacious goals. The old mm-hmm. way of goal setting was to ask yourself the question, what would I dare to dream if I knew I couldn't fail? And then there's books written called the 10X Rule. Take your $10,000 goal and put a zero behind it and make it a $100,000 goal and take the $100,000 goal and turn it into a million goal and take that million dollar goal and turn it into a 10 million. Well, you may as well just make it a hundred million. And the old way was to have these big, lofty, hairy, audacious goals. And it seems very romantic. But what happens on the inside is on the inside, you look at that goal and you say, That's absolutely impossible for me. How can I go from having nothing to becoming a billionaire in a couple of years? It's never happened in my family. It's never happened in my environment. I don't have the resources available. And it spikes a little bit of dopamine. That's why I said this is not the Tony Robbins model of motivation. You know, when you go to a big seminar, you jump up and down, you jump up and down, you jump up and down, you you get a dopamine hit. But that's not real life. I could never imagine walking into a million dollar business and saying to the business owner, I've got to go pump myself up, stand outside the boardroom and jump up and down and go, woo, and do incantations and affirmations in a business setting. That's not real life. You know, the motivation has got to come from within and we call it constrained enthusiasm, but it has to come with realistic goals. The new way of goal setting is setting a goal that has a 100% chance of success. And think about it. Would you ever procrastinate 
if you had a 100% chance of success, would you procrastinate? No. No. Because you know you're going to succeed. But if I have a goal that I have a 100% chance of failure, do I want to waste my time, my energy, my resources? Am I going to take action on something that I know is impossible? Never. So the new way is to start by having a look at your personality. What are my God-given gifts? How am I wired? What's the right career for me? What makes my heart tick? And then it's setting a goal with a 100% chance of success. And then it's retraining your brain. And what you do is once you achieve the goal, you get confidence. And then as you get more confidence, you reduce the failure and success rate. Then you say, this goal has a 99% chance of success and only a 1% chance of failure. Everybody is going to take action on that because they know luck is on their side. You know, my grandfather was a gambler and he would roll the dice, but his risk tolerance was really high. When I roll the dice, I don't have that level of risk tolerance in my personality. Mm. So what I do is I set a goal that has a lower level of risk, but the reward is still the same. I still get dopamine, I still get serotonin, I still get all those happy hormones in my body when I achieve that. And then over time, just like lifting weights, you start with one kilo, you go to two kilos, all of a sudden you're at five kilos and 10 and you're bench pressing 100 kilos you build up over the time. And that's the new way. You develop your confidence. You develop the belief in yourself. You become the person that you need to become to have and do whatever you desire. And that's the new way. And if you do it like that, you'll never be disappointed. You'll never sabotage. You'll never procrastinate because you'll have that belief that this is going to work. And that's the new way. I really like the new way, for sure. And when someone sits down, um, how do you recommend they structure it? Start with the the end in mind and then deconstruct it and create little milestones along the way? Or do you have a specific methodology for goal setting? There's three types of motivation. Um, the first type of motivation is what we call biological motivation. And we should never question somebody's motivation. Everybody's motivated. You get up in the morning, and if you really need to go to, go to the bathroom, you're going to jump out of bed. <laughs> when you're hungry, you're going to bite people. You're going to push them out of the way. You're going to jump into that refrigerator. Everybody's motivated for the biological needs. The other two motivators, one comes from within and one comes from without. The Where we are in the world at the moment is we're celebrating extrinsic goals. We're celebrating things like a house, a car, a watch, a handbag, a ring. And unfortunately, all of these things are extrinsic motivations. They exist outside of ourself. And all extrinsic motivation is what we call if-then motivation. So. Your boss says to you, if you work really hard this year and you bring into the business a million dollars, then I'll give you a $10,000 bonus. Within yourself, you say, so much of that is out of my control. You could wake up at five o'clock in the morning, you could hustle till nine o'clock at night, and you could do everything right. And then the company might not spend their money wisely, or something might happen in the economy that prevents you from making that final sale. And so at the end of the day, you bring in $900,999 and you don't get your $10,000 bonus. And it's happened to everybody. Everybody's experienced something like that. If then motivation exists outside of ourself and we only get the motivation if we get the reward. But if you don't get the reward, you get disappointment. And you think to yourself, I just wasted a year of my life. The boss screwed up and now it impacts me. And so that's out of our control. And especially coming through the period of COVID, a lot of people are experiencing a form of hope depression. And what I mean by that is they had hopes and dreams and goals and wishes. And all of a sudden COVID come along and it wiped it out for most people. 
And for that future that they wanted to create, it's all disappeared. And now they're depressed about what they've perceived as a loss. So that's an extrinsic motivator. Yes, we need them, but they don't work all that well. We've got to start with intrinsic motivators. And intrinsic motivators is all about self-development. It's about personal development. It's about the person that you need to become. You know, you could spend a whole year developing resiliency, and that one skill will serve you for life. The tax man can't take it away from you. If they take your passport away from you, they can't take away your resiliency. Whatever happens in the world, wherever you go in the world, you're always going to have that skill of resiliency. And that will build up your self-esteem. That will build up your self-worth. So the place that I recommend people start is start from within. What are those qualities that you need to be successful? You know, most people say, when I make a million dollars, then I'll invest in myself. (laughs) The law of investment says you have to make an investment before you get a return. You've got to develop that millionaire mindset, those characteristics, those qualities before you get the million dollars. How do we know that's true? Almost every single person who wins the lottery is bankrupt in a couple of years. Why? Because they never (laughs) developed their mindset. So start from within. You'll keep those skills for life. And that's what happened to me with wakeboarding. That 10 years of conditioning the mind and the body and the soul, I've got that for life. Nobody can take that away from me. And it's helped me build multiple businesses. So start with him. That's the place. What are your thoughts on building a winning team? And I say that because we have many entrepreneurs and founders in our community. What are some of those drivers? Well, 66% of the people that you hire (laughs) will turn out to be wrong. And for every bad hire, In your business, it's going to cost you five times the yearly salary of that position. So bad hires are very expensive. And I was working with a company and we couldn't figure out why we weren't making any money. We're looking at the profit and loss statement and it just didn't add up. And so we started to have a look at how many bad hires they had in the business. Every year, this business had 10 bad hires. Each of those bad hires cost the business a million dollars. They were losing $10 million a year because of bad hires, and it doesn't show up on the P&L. So what we've got to do today in hiring people, we've got to trust in science. Today, we have the science, we have the technology to identify high performers. Now, the difference between a high performer and a low performer is about 450% difference. And what that means is, is that for the same income, the business is going to get a 450% return on the high performer. So the high performer is going to bring in 450% more than they cost you. Now, how do you identify them? Well, you've got to use a science called job matching. You've got to have a look at the role and you've got to understand what qualities does this role need for success? How should this role approach problems? How should it approach people? How should it deal with the pace of the environment? How should it deal with policy? And you've got to think through that because if you have a role that requires a very low risk tolerance, but you bring in a very high risk tolerant person, it's going to create mayhem. They're going to take risks in the role that lead to failure. We've also got to look at the role and say, what would motivate somebody to do this job? Now, the research has been done, and I work with a lot of companies who have sales organizations. The number one predictor in success is not your behavioral style. It's not your behavioral style. It's your motivational style. And 76% of the world's top performers are motivated by economical reasons. Return on investment of time, talent, energy, opportunity. And what they say is they say, I will work hard for a great reward. 
And that's what drives top salespeople. 76% are top performers. The second thing that drives a top performer is to work in a practical environment. And every business has had this problem. They say, we've got this top performer, but they don't want to follow the system. We've got this top performer, but they won't do the paperwork. They don't want to do it. They want to be in an environment where they don't need to do it. There's no money in the paperwork for the salesperson. Stop giving it to them. So knowing these two things, if you hired just on what motivated people, you'd build a winning team immediately. And so these are two of the things we're looking at. We're also looking at critical thinking, how people think. People in personal development believe They have a power to change people. We don't have any power to change people. People don't change. People are wired in a certain way. And every single day, it just reinforces that wiring. 65% of our personality traits are inborn at the time of birth. Horses run fast. Horses aren't good to plow the fields. (laughs) A bullock is built like a tank. It's built to plow the field. It's not going to run the race. But what we think we have is this ability to turn the cow into a horse. (laughs) It's just the way it's wired. So we've got to look at people's critical thinking. Are these people really good with people? If they are, put them in a people-centric role. Does this person need to be focused on tactical activities right now in the moment? If they are, put them in that environment and they'll succeed. Or do you need a systemic long-term thinker? You know, Jeff Bezos, what he says is he needs his executives, top-level executives, sleeping eight hours per day. Now, we're going back to sleep. He says he needs his top executives Mm. sleeping eight hours a day. And they asked him, why do you need them sleeping eight hours a day? He said, because I need my executive team well-rested because they're making decisions about the quarter that we're going to be in a decade from now. Now, if you want people thinking that long-term, you need somebody who's a systemic thinker. And so if you look at these people scientifically and remove your bias, now a bias, this is really unfortunate for business people, uh, more than 80% of hiring decisions are made in the first five minutes of meeting somebody. Imagine that you've spent 30 years building a business worth $100 million and you make a hiring decision within five minutes because you go, we follow the same football team. We have a gender bias. He's a man like me. She's a woman like me. We have a confirmation bias. This person says, we go to the same church. We go to the same mosque. They must be great. That doesn't make a good hire. We've got to start to trust in science. And the science has been created. And if you use the science, you can reduce the risk of a bad hire by up to 93%. And that's what you've got to do to build a winning team. If you don't mind recapping on some of those pillars of emotional intelligence, I'm sure it'll be really interesting to the audience, especially in terms of how can we master some of the skills that will support those five pillars? Yep. Number one, self-awareness. Self-awareness is understanding why you think and feel the way that you do. And you have an incredible piece of technology. And if we trust in science, we can learn more about ourselves in a short assessment than we could possibly learn in 20 or 30 years of self-discovery. Trust in science. The science has been created to help us succeed Mm. fast. Secondly, we have to learn to regulate our emotions. So the second pillar of emotional intelligence is self-regulation. That's about getting out of any mental or emotional rut that we find ourselves in. And a lot of people, if they're really honest, they've got a hope, a dream, or a wish, and they wanted to do it in their 20s. They're now in their 30s, 40s, maybe they're even 45, and they still have that hope, that dream, that wish, but they haven't been able to get out of their comfort zone, their mental rut, to take action on it. So you've got to learn here how to move forward. You've got to learn how to take the right action at the right time. Thirdly, the third pillar is motivation. And this is about resiliency. It's about getting knocked down. And you've had people on your podcast who just say, just learn to fail. 
Just learn to fail, just learn to fail, just learn to fail, just learn to fail. And the truth is you, you don't learn much from success. And if I meet somebody who says they've got imposter syndrome, I've always met somebody who's succeeded and they have no idea what's happened. And they live in fear. My gosh, what if somebody actually finds out that I don't even know what I'm doing? I've worked with businesses that have billions of dollars worth of revenue. And the owner's like, Daniel, I'm so afraid to hire people because when they ask questions, I don't know how to answer it. I just got lucky. And I'm afraid that people are going to find me out and they're going to expose me. Mark Boris, he says the same thing, the exact same thing. Fourthly, we have social awareness. Social awareness is empathy. It's understanding why other people think and feel the way that they do. And in our generation, we were taught about the golden rule. And the golden rule says, treat others the way that you want to be treated. Hi, I'm Daniel. I'm aggressive. <laughs> Hi, I'm Daniel. I'm discontent. I'm never satisfied. Hi, I'm Daniel. I'm a risk taker and I don't pay attention to details. If I treated the entire world like that, they would freak out. The new rule is the platinum rule. Treat others the way they want to be treated. And again, trust in science. This is what I say to my leaders. Use scientific reports. Understand people's behaviours and lead them based on their behaviours and you'll get the best out of them. And fifthly, we have what's called um, social regulation. And social regulation is the ability to communicate. It's the ability to be a subject matter expert on your topic. It's the ability to speak and capture people's attention. And if we want to become good leaders, if we want to become great leaders, we have to learn how to communicate our ideas. And it's in that social regulation where all leadership takes place. Could you imagine a leader who was a poor communicator? Could you imagine a leader who couldn't articulate the company vision? Could you imagine a leader of a country who couldn't articulate what they, where they want to be in 10 to 15 years from now? Now, probably a lot of people are saying, yeah, Daniel, I can imagine that. Well, it's true. There's a lot of leaders around the world like that right now. What do they call it? Word mm -hmm. salad. We have to be able to have people who can clearly articulate where we're going to be. Because mm -hmm. if we know the road to success and what it looks like, the ups and downs, the twists and turns, we're not going to procrastinate. We're going to say, well, we anticipated that and we'll learn to manage it as we go. So they're, they're the five pillars of emotional intelligence. And big companies like Pepsi, they're training their people on emotional intelligence and productivity has gone up 10%. What does that tell you? It tells you people have stopped procrastinating. L'Oreal, when they hire salespeople with emotional intelligence competencies, those salespeople make two and a half million US dollars per year more in sales. What does that tell you about emotional intelligence? The US Air Force, one of the best in the world, air superiority. By hiring people with emotional intelligence skills, they have saved the Air Force $190 million. If you're thinking about going to a hotel, you've probably heard of Sheraton Resorts and Hotels. They train their teams on emotional intelligence and they've captured an additional 24% of market share. So there's no downsides. Well, there is one downside to emotional intelligence, which is probably a positive. The only person who suffers from you having better emotional intelligence is your competitor. <laughs> They're going to wish and hope that you didn't learn about it because you're going to win all their market share. <laughs> mm. Some people think that being too emotionally intelligent um, could actually lead to others walking all over you. You know, they get confused between people pleasing and empathy. Uh, mm. I've read a lot about empathic distress, but I guess the key is, and I'd love to hear your perspective, is just making sure that you have that insight in your self-awareness and create some boundaries where necessary. You can be highly emotionally intelligent without being walked all over. From from my experience, when, and, and my experience is more than 2,000, 
emotional quotient assessments delivered. I've delivered more than 2,000 scientific reports just on emotional intelligence. And the one thing that I found for all entrepreneurs and the salespeople was that when your empathy score went beyond 90 points, you become disabled. And what I mean by that is the empathy score is so high that you start to experience the other person's emotions as if they're your own. You start to absorb the other person's emotions. When they come up with objections, you take those on and say, oh my gosh, if I was in this situation, I'd be feeling the exact same way. And it disables them. They stop selling. They stop moving the sales process forward. They stop handling the rejections because all of a sudden, the other person's emotions become theirs. And what we say is that emotions are contagious. And if you've got an empathy score above 90, you become a highly sensitive person. You can look at the other person's facial expressions. Your neurotransmitters start to go berserk and you're like, oh my gosh, this person's angry. You start to feel the anger in your body. Fight, flight or freeze response kicks in. If they're afraid and you can see that on their facial expressions, you start to feel the fear and you go, oh my gosh, why am I feeling this way? Oh, it's because you're a highly sensitive person and your empathy is not working for you. It's working against you. Some of the best sales people are people with lower levels of empathy. You know what? They say, mm. you called me for a reason. You wouldn't be calling me if you didn't want to buy. And whatever you throw at me, I'm just going to let it slide by because I know it's a smokescreen objection. And they just keep selling, selling, and selling. Now, that may be good in the short term, but it's not always good in the long term because it's like that die or buy model. But some businesses are okay with that. Some people are okay with that. So there's a, there's a healthy balance. And I would say levels of empathy around 70 to 80 points is really good. If it's above 90, you've got to be excellent with self-regulation. Uh, but for me, yeah. I'm a highly sensitive person. And when I built my business, I actually took myself out of the sales role because what would happen is I would meet people and I want to get into coaching mode. I want to help them too fast. Yeah. But you got to sell first. So I yeah. learned that my empathy is great for being a coach and a consultant, but I built a sales team who's much more effective than me. So that's how empathy can help or hurt. Excellent. Daniel, how can people find out more about emotional intelligence and connecting with you? We've recently released a piece of technology called Mind Report. And Mind Report, within a 90 second voice recording, we can measure your levels of emotional intelligence. We can look at your personality type, what makes you stressed, and we can also identify your inner potential. And within a 90 second voice recording, coupled with AI and big data, we can help you learn more about yourself in 90 seconds than you could possibly do in 30 years of self-discovery. Uh, Brad, I know you've experienced the technology for yourself. And if anybody else wants to experience it, you can go to my website, danieltolson.com. On the top right-hand side of the page, it'll say Mind Report Free. Click on that button, take the Mind Report, and I'll personally step you through the report so you understand your levels of emotional intelligence and how you can apply it to be really successful. And this piece of technology, it's helping people have breakthroughs that they've never been able to have on their own. So uh, Brad, I've got your report in front of me. I love your qualities and characteristics and I want everybody else to have the same experience. Thank you. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on my results, and I'm happy for it to be shared on, on a podcast. Okay, cool. Well, the best part about this technology is there's no bias. And what we mean by that is there's no yes or no, if or then type yeah. questions. What the technology is measuring is the vibrations in your voice. Those vocal vibrations uh, connected to your brain and your bodily organ functions. And it will give you a really great snapshot in time. Uh, imagine an x-ray. We go to the doctor, we've got a broken arm, we can't see it, 
but the doctor performs an x-ray and the doctor can see through the skin and see the bone that's broken. Mind report is like that, but it makes the invisible visible. It's looking at your mindset. It's looking at your emotions and it makes all of that visible. So when I unpacked your report, the first thing in here is that you've got some phenomenal qualities. And when I analyzed your mind report, and as we're spending time together today, and I'm analyzing you through that lens, it just all lines up. So the first thing for you is stress type. Now, I was recently working with a hospital in my area, and they said, Daniel, when people come to the hospital, they're coming for three reasons, stress, sleep, and anxiety. All of us experience stress, but we experience it in a different way. The type of stress that impacts you, Brad, is what's called emotional emotional stress. And what that means is that you have no worries. You don't lose sleep over finance. You don't lose sleep over the future. You don't lose sleep over health. And we're going to come back to health in a moment because I had a look at your root chakra and your physical health is really good. What you will lose sleep over is family. You'll lose sleep over friends and you'll lose sleep over relationships. And it just means that you care so much about people that your clients, you'll probably wake up at one o'clock in the morning and go, oh my gosh, what's my client done with their life? <laughs> you don't lose sleep over the money, but you worry about the clients. You know, you're like I wrote down here, I'm like, he's a cool cat. He's so chilled out. And I can see that in our time together. You're just so chilled out. And so for your style of stress, you don't explode in the moment. Your stress will just build up over time, over time, over time. Every now and then you'll be like Mount Mount Helen, you'll erupt and you'll explode. <laughs> After you explode five minutes later, you're back to love and peace and harmony. Very true. Does it sound like you? 100%. I can't believe this came from a voice recording. <laughs> you know, the... We've been studying um, personality and, um, you know, in traditional Chinese medicine, the data goes back 5,000 years and personality mm. types are predictable. And we're not born with a blueprint for how we think, feel and act. But this mind report gives us the blueprint. And for you, you know, you have another podcast, the Resiliency Podcast. What's it about? <laughs> it's about people. It's about emotions. And the fact that you're doing that, you're playing to your strengths. And everybody has that feeling who hates their job. They're like, these skills that I have don't even align with this job. I'm not even using my inner potential. There was a statistic not long ago that said 84% of the population have a feeling of unfulfilled potential. They've got these God-given gifts, but in their career, they can't even use it. And what you're doing worldwide with the Resiliency Network aligns with this perfect type of stress. Excellent. The second thing we look at in the report is our personality type. And your personality type, and I love it again, and it really works well with what you're doing, is called the guardian personality. It's the protector of people. And so for you, you're very loyal. You're very loyal to the people that you work with, you're very loyal to the company that you represent. You're very loyal to the mission that you're on. And it would be very hard for some, somebody to dissuade you on your direction. When it comes to people, you see the best in people. You know they're going through the worst time of their life, but you will see the best in them. And within you, your character wants to safeguard people. You want to support others. And so your guardian personality aligns perfectly with your emotional stress type. For you, if people were to describe you and we're meeting for the first time today, they'd describe you as reliable. They would describe you as trustworthy. And the reason why I know that's going to be true is because you have to be a trustworthy person to work with people's emotions. People have a feeling that I can trust this person or not. They'll meet you and they'll say, I can trust Brad. Would that be fair to say? Definitely, yeah. I try and put that at the, you know, 
at the f- front of any relationship is just to really be there and be present and non-judgmental and want the best for everyone. It's true. I can also see here is that perseverance is a characteristic that you've developed. You might call it resiliency. Today, I'm going to call it perseverance. Mm -hmm. It's a similar skill set. But once you decide on something, you're all in. People probably say Mm. to you, don't burn your bridges. You're like, no, I'm going to burn the bridges. I'm not burning emotional bridges. I'm just not turning back. I'm going to burn the boat. And for you, in you, you just can't go back. doesn't matter how deep you've gone. I'm going and I'm going to get through this darkness. <laughs> I'm going to come out the other side. And, and it's pretty true. When we look at personality, it also reveals some of our childhood experiences. And this can be quite challenging for people. You know, they repress their childhood, but those formative years, those first seven years of our life actually form the people that we are today. So when you were growing up, was there a lot of uncertainties? in your environment? Was there different types of dangers in your environment and you always had to be mindful of what was happening? 100%. It was a very tumultuous uh, start to life with uh, all kinds of adversity. Mm. Did you have a similar experience to me where you were punished for making mistakes or when you wanted to try something new, somebody might step in and not let you try something new, try to overly protect you? Um, Perhaps. You know, the school system in South Africa growing up was very much command and conquer. So you wanted to step outside the lines or be creative or come up with new ideas or voice your opinion. It would result in a cane, most likely. Uh, so so it was extremely rigid. Um, I really struggled with with that. I And I was, had a curious mind. So it it just felt like get crushed, crush, crush you down and, um, and accept that life is going to be this kind of hierarchy of command and you need to find your place within that. So definitely there. And then just staying out of uh, the way of, you know, very heightened emotions at home when trouble yeah. would break out, you know, just learning how to manage that. And that's probably where the high empathy comes from. I know what that facial expression means. I know what that means <laughs> and being very tuned to it. Perfect. And these childhood experiences, they create the men and women that we are today. And mm. what I encourage people is to um, embrace that. For me, uh, my personality style is the same as yours. Um, there was a lot of uncertainties for me. Uh, I was punished for making mistakes. And what have I committed my life to? Helping people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we've got to understand this. And when we position ourselves, and, and that's why I could never be in construction. My father was in construction. Uh, all of my friends were in constructions. It never suited me. I was like, I don't want to build a house. I want to build up a person. Yeah. And so for me, yeah. whilst I tried to do those things, I just felt disconnected. But like you, when times are good, you'll love what you're doing. When times are bad and maybe the money's not coming through as you hoped, you still love what you're doing and you never lose enthusiasm. And that's the goal. Mm -hmm. Uh, As we say in business building, you've got to get the right people on the bus and then you've got to get the right people in the right position. And I can see here Mm -hmm. you've positioned yourself perfectly because of who you are. So success still comes with its challenges, but the ups and downs won't be as bad because you say, this just suits me. So that's personality. The other thing which is really fascinating with this technology, and I would say at least 50% of the world's population have heard of energy centers or chakras in the body. So my technology can also measure the level of energy in all seven chakras. And this is fascinating because if we have any chakras that are out of balance, then what happens is we create illness or disease inside of our body. The level of energy in our chakras also influences our personality type. And so for the one that I want to focus on for you today is your root chakra. This is the one that's all the way down at the bottom of the spine. And this root chakra for you is perfectly balanced. 
And the reason why I want to highlight that is because the root chakra is also about safety and security. Your guardian personality style is also about safety and security. So this reinforces, but it also amplifies all of those qualities. So for you, people are going to meet you and they're going to say, this guy's grounded. And what I was thinking before I met you and I asked you at the start of the show, I was thinking, you can make home wherever you go. And in New Zealand, mm. they have a saying called Tudonga Wai Wai, which is about your belonging place. And I bet wherever you go in the world, you feel grounded. You can say, this is my new home. 100%. And that's why I've probably never felt grounded in one particular location, because it all feels like that. Yep. So that mm. root chakra is really strong. You're very much connected to the earth. And you're going to have really good physical health at this time of your life. How do you feel about your health at the moment? Oh, it's excellent. But I put in a lot of practice. Yep. And mm. people who have a root chakra that's underactive, they won't put the practice in. If it's overactive, they won't put the practice in. For you, you'll put it in because it's, it's balanced. So it says that you're going to have great health here. Also, when you meet people... Uh, I believe that you're going to treat everybody like they're your family. Mm -hmm. And what is your superpower and probably also uh, scares people at times is your intuitive abilities. You can read mm. people like a book. That is so interesting, Daniel. It's so true. Oh, uh, I get that sense constantly and i am rarely wrong which which i even find a little bit strange i just get these strong intuitive feelings about a person's intentions or you know whether or not this is going to be a successful partnership and i mean yeah you hope that that doesn't influence the outcome because i've had that intuition but most of the time even if i'm not directly involved i can see things panning out it's very interesting you're a highly mm. sensitive person, and that intuition, uh, if I could make any recommendation, is leverage it more and more because we're mm. given these God-given gifts, and especially in this field, uh, what I learned many years ago was to test my intuition. And my mentor said to me, Daniel, just test your intuition. Say to the person, feel free to accept or reject what I'm about to say. Is this the situation? And when I learned to do that, 99 out of 100 times, people said, absolutely. The other one wow. out of 100 would say, yes, and I'd like to add this. Yeah. So you've got a wonderful superpower there. What, what, I, what wow. I find interesting when I look at your energy centers, and I want to check in, and, and again, uh, feel free to accept or reject this. Um, do you have visions about the future? Do you have the ability to look out into the future and kind of predict what's going to happen for yourself and others? It's a good question. I do visualize the future. I, you know, and it's interesting dreams that I had or visualizations that I had when I was younger tend to happen, which has made me very careful to visualize the right things because, and not visualize too small. Be, yep. because I, most of what I wanted or really longed for and visualized ha has happened. So I'm at this point in my life at being 46, I realize that I need to be quite um, discerning and intentional about what it is. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to explain that a little bit deeper because what I can see in your chakras. Um, the next question is that, um, when you have those ideas about the future for yourself and others, are they both optimistic? Do you see the best in where things can go, but you also come with a level of fear because you're going to see what can go bad for yourself or others? Do you have that ability as well? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, there's, there's, there's both. I mean, I tend to stay optimistic, but there's always that uh, a few nagging doubts, you know, the survival layer 
will I be able to get what if it goes wrong? Will we survive? But I've got quite become quite risk tolerant. You know, I've realized that most of the time things end up falling into place. So I don't tend to put too much focus on the negative, but there is definitely some doubt there. You know, what yeah. do I have the skills or the resources or will people believe in the vision? That kind of stuff, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Because what I what I see here is that uh, your crown, your third eye, and your throat chakra are all overactive. And it means that we get a lot of energy taking place in the upper half of the body. And that gives us almost like a psychic ability. And then your solar plexus and your sacral chakras are too low and it's underactive. So we can often have a disconnect between the the head and what we see and our ability to take action on it. So what I'd recommend for you is to trust in those visions. Because when we mm. say overactive, we don't always say that's bad. When people have an overactive crown and a third eye chakra, they develop psychic abilities, the ability to project out, see what could possibly happen, and then actually communicate it to others. The blockage here is just to take action on it. And it's more about taking action on those things that you really want to happen. Like you said before, yes. you would visualize it when you were young and it came true when you're older. Yeah. Just put more energy into that action component and you'll start to have a lot more balance in your life. You'll start to have all those breakthroughs that you hoped and wished for and they'll come through really fast. And that's the solar Amazing. plexus chakra. Solar plexus chakra is all about willpower, not about discipline. It's about willpower. And mine and your solar plexus is both underactive. And so we're disciplined people, but we might not just have the willpower like a Donald Trump. Like when you look at Donald Trump, it's just whether you like him or not, it's just super willpower. It's just go, 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 campaign, campaign, campaign. Like he's born mm -hmm. with that super willpower. Other people yeah. wish they could have it. They would like to have it, but we just didn't get mm -hmm. programmed with it. So yeah. for you and I, we always have to make sure that we've got plenty of sleep and plenty of energy so we can force ourselves into action. Just a little bit more challenging for you and I there. So that's what I can oh. see uh, on your eight-page report and hopefully it makes sense it really does thank you so much for the debrief i appreciate it and i'd love to dive deeper with you uh at a, another time um thank you for investing so much time in this podcast and I'm, I'm sure our those listeners who've tuned in will really appreciate it many many thanks daniel everyone please My do pleasure. click the links in the show notes and um i wish you all the best daniel thank you so much for your time today my pleasure. We'll do it again soon. 